So, uh, thanks for joining us here this morning. Uh, the other day, when I was in uh, preparation for the sermon, I did a quick Google search on uh, just the word "hat America," and these, uh, take a listen to just some of the headlines that, that I came across. The headline said, "American happiness hits record low." And that was in February of 2022. Another headline says, new data shows Americans more miserable than we've been in half a century. Another one, America is obsessed with happiness and it's making us miserable. Americans are spending a fortune on finding happiness. Americans are the happiest they've, are, sorry, the unhappiest they've been in 50 years. And that article was taken in 2022, or I'm sorry, 2020, before the pandemic. And the headline to that article said it finds that just 14% of adults say they are happy. 14%. And that was just the first page of the Google results. Is it safe to say that Americans have more stuff than we've ever had, but we're more discontent than we've been since probably the Great Depression? Between flat screen TVs, cutting edge cell phones, uh, phone, uh, cars, houses, toys, endless entertainment, all these things we have. America is the single most uh, populous and uh, wealthiest country in the world, and yet we are more miserable than we've been in a very long time. So something's broken, you know? Something isn't going right. We are doing something wrong. Our passage today is going to address that. We're going to be in Philippians. We're going to be in chapter 4. And we're going to be starting in verse 10. So Philippians chapter 4, verse 10. He goes on, he says, I rejoiced in the Lord greatly that now at length you have revived your concern for me. You were indeed concerned for me, but you had no opportunity. Not that I am speaking of being in need, for I have learned in whatever situation I am to be content. I know how to be brought low, and I know how to abound. In any, in every circumstance, I have learned the secret of facing plenty and hunger, abundance and need. I can do all things through him, and strengthen them. Now we've been studying uh, the Philippians in our community group, and it's just it's such a great book. It's, um, we've had a really good time studying it. it. Even though I've tried to slow it down, it's just gone way too quick. It's a small book, and it's, but it's so full of um, you know, love and joy and relationships, and it really is a book that shows us the standard of what the church is supposed to be like. Uh, regarding our relationship to each other and regarding, of course, our relationship to the Lord. But I have to give a little bit of background here for this sermon to kind of make some sense here because we are kind of jumping in uh, towards the end. So a little bit of background. Paul is in jail as he writes this letter to the Philippians. This is his first imprisonment in Rome. He was imprisoned two times while in Rome, and the second time he was imprisoned, he was murdered, he was killed. So this is the first time. Um, prior to being in jail here in Rome, he was in jail for two years back in Jerusalem. Uh, he got a mock trial there. That's when he appealed to Caesar. You have to go back to the book of Acts to kind of see all this. That's when he appealed to Caesar. He was sent to Rome, suffered a shipwreck, had to swim to the island of Malta, got bit by a snake. Some of you guys are not, and you definitely know this stuff. But um, he did all of that to get to Rome. He sits in jail for two years here. This is during that first a two-year stint in, in Rome. Another detail, uh, just to kind of, again, still laying the background of what Paul is currently going in, he writes these words. Um, he's in jail, and he is chained to a guard 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And this is not some, like, six-foot-long chain. It's about 18 inches. It's really no longer than the length of this music stand. Um, he was chained to six Roman guards, and they would each take a four-hour shift. There's no privacy for bathroom breaks, no privacy for sleeping, nothing. 
right? He was with a guard 24 hours a day, seven days a week, for two whole years. And by the way, he was innocent. So it makes the whole thing like that much worse. All right, so that's where Paul is, okay? Now, this letter was written to the Philippians. So who are they, and where did they come from? The Philippian church was planted, again, you have to go back in the book of Acts, and some of you may know the story about the woman who kept calling out after Paul. And he turned around and he cursed her, and the demons came out of her, and that caused a big ruckus, and so he got thrown into jail. And he was thrown into jail, that's when the earthquake happened, and the, the guard was going to kill himself because he thought everybody escaped, Paul stopped him. And they ended up going to the jailer's house and converting the family, and that's how the Philippian church started. It started there in that uh, as a house plant in that jailer's house. Now that was ten years prior to writing this letter. That's a detail that's going to be important here in a little bit. We start breaking down the scriptures because for right now, just know it was ten years prior to writing this letter. And so the Philippians, having heard of Paul's uh, situation of him being in jail, they sent a messenger named Epaphroditus to give Paul a gift, a representation of their love and care for the man who started the church in this city. We don't know exactly what that gift was. Um, it may have been money, it may have been food, it may have been clothing, it may have been some combination of all three. We just don't know. Uh, but it was enough to prompt a pretty uh, illicit response from the Apostle Paul. All right, so that's just a little bit of a background very little bit of a background to this book and to this letter and where we're at. So let's pick up now with Paul and pick up at the last part of this amazing epistle as he's actually starting to wind down the letter. And I'll pick up here in verse 10. So verse 10 says, I rejoice in the Lord greatly that now at length you have revived your concern for me. You were indeed concerned for me, but you had no opportunity. Rejoice in the Lord greatly notice right away, where does Paul's rejoicing go? He receives this gift, and he does not say, boy, I rejoice that you, that you love me, or I rejoice in the gift, or I rejoice that you remember me. He says, where does this rejoicing go? It goes straight to the Lord. I rejoice in the Lord greatly, not in the things that he got. He then says that now at length. Okay, now this is where that 10 year detail comes into play. It was 10 years from when Paul planted that church until right now he's writing. I have to break out of our passage here a little bit to explain something super quick, uh, but it just makes this portion of scripture a little bit clearer. Back in Acts 17, like we talked about, Paul went to Philippi, planted that church, and then he left that church and he went out to a couple other places and then went to Thessalonica. Back in our book in Philippians 4 16, which is just a couple verses after where we're going to be today. Uh, it was just a little bit lower where Paul says, even in Thessalonica, you sent help for my needs once and again. Okay, so Paul is saying here, look, I had just left you and your support almost beat me to Thessalonica. You were so eager to help me. Okay, but then back at our passage, he says that now at length. And what he's saying here is, look, I know you guys really helped me almost before I got to Thessalonica, and that was great. I just haven't heard from you since then. And it's nice to know that you remember me after all this time. That your love for me wasn't just some flash in the pan emotional response because I had just left you. But here after 10 full years, you still remember me and you were eager to help me out in my affliction. He emphasizes this uh, by repeating it in verse 10. And he says, you were indeed concerned for me. But you had no opportunity. Now that was kind of an odd expression that stuck out to me, so I looked into that. What, what's he talking about here? He had no opportunity. Well, some commentaries said that the reason that they didn't have an opportunity is because they just didn't have the means, right? I.e., they were they were too poor to actually help and do it. But I don't think that's the case. I mean, just playing out what we just talked about about Thessalonica, uh, they helped him there. I don't think they would have, you know helped him and then lost all their wealth and then gained it all back in such a short time. It just doesn't quite make sense to me. Uh, so I think it either means one of two things. It either means that the other churches were helping Paul uh, because they were just closer to wherever he was at that time, or um, they just didn't know about his struggle. And I tend to lean towards this last one, given the verbiage throughout the whole epistle. It just seems to fit a little bit better. It's like he's saying, you didn't know, but as soon as you heard, you were eager to respond. You've got to remember that there was no texting back then, right? There was no 
email. There wasn't even snail mail, right? And even just forget the post office in general, just the act of writing a letter was a big deal, right? They didn't have paper, right? They didn't have the knowledge to even know how to write, right? So uh, communication back then wasn't like it is today. Uh, so it was just a big deal to even uh, send a letter. So this just tends to fit that, that no opportunity. It just means that they just didn't know. But as soon as they did, and immediately, after 10 years, they sacrificed and gained to Paul to be used to birth. All right, so now, moving on to verse 11. Paul's happy that they sent him a gift. And Paul immediately uh, seems to inject this clarifying statement. It's a disclaimer, uh, if you will. He says, not that I'm speaking of being in need, for I have learned in whatever situation I am to be content. You see, he does not want the Philippians to misunderstand why he was rejoicing in this way. Uh, he, it's like he's saying, thank you for the amazing gift. And I was not, not that I was in need. Right? Another, some of your translations may translate it, not that I speak in respect of want. Or perhaps more in today's vernacular, don't think I'm saying that because. Right? So he's saying, uh, don't think I'm rejoicing over your gift. Because I was in want. Right? That's how we would say it. Paul is not rejoicing simply because they gave him stuff. Right? But he's happy because of three reasons. One, it confirms his faith in God that God will always meet his needs. Okay? This is God's providence. We'll talk about that in a little bit when we get down to verse 13. Okay? Two, he's happy that the Philippian church was mature enough and cared enough about him that they would be willing to sacrifice him. In other words, they haven't regressed over the past 10 years, right? They're still alive, they're still strong, they're maturing, they're growing, they're thriving, okay? So that brings him happiness. And the third reason why he's happy is that they, uh, he's happy that they gave because it meant more reward in their own basket, okay? Again, you have to go outside of scripture, just to, or, sorry, outside of our passage, in scripture, outside of our passage, uh, just a little bit to explain this. But down in verse 17, he makes this clear when he says, not that I seek the gift, but I seek the fruit that increases to your credit. He's saying, you gave to me, and that makes me happy because it increases your credit. It's almost like, like a bank, right? And like God is like the creditor. When you make a deposit, it increases your credit. Then Paul goes on in verse 19, he says, And my God will supply every need of yours according to his riches in glory in Christ Jesus. So he's saying, you make a deposit, and watch how God repays your every need. A quick side note here, just so there's no prosperity preaching going on, right? Note that it says every need, right? Not every one, right? I'm not saying, you know, you tithe and you're going to get a longer need. That's just not how this works. Um, but it goes back to your motive. It goes back to um, what's in your heart. And if you give something just so you can get something, you get nothing. But if you give because you're so moved by the love of God and what he has done for you, and then out of that overflow of adoration, you end up giving joyfully, that is what is credited now, we're not going to get to all those passages today, obviously. That just kind of rounds out the story. So, back to where we were here in verse 11. Paul is saying, I am not in need because I have learned to be content no matter what the circumstances. Remember the open. Remember all the circumstances that I kind of laid out real quickly that he's in jail, in the regard. He has no chance for ministry outreach. So, obviously, the burning desire of Paul's heart, right? Um, uh, yeah, he, you know, like I said, he was chained to, to, to a guard. Um, all that stuff that was going on. He has learned to be content in all of those uh, circumstances. In the New Testament here, the word used for learn implies something which, while at the very nature of something may be obscure, it is now revealed. Okay? Or if it was hidden, it is now revealed. So Paul is saying this elusive state of being content and learning how to live in that, while that was at one time obscure, I have now figured it out. 
although it was hidden, I have now figured it out. How? How did he figure out? Well, that's what he found upon in verse 12. Verse 12, he says, I know how to be brought low, and I know how to abound. In any, in every circumstance, I have learned the secret of facing plenty and hunger, abundance and need. Now, we tend to read that, and it's just words to us. But as we've been studying this book in our community group, it just continually dawns on me that Paul is a real person, right? He was a real person, He's no different than you and me. Uh, if you think Paul, you know, this real human on this real planet, doesn't know how to be brought low, listen to his own account of what he has suffered, and, and, and actually think about what he is saying here. I'm going to be reading, I don't think it's going to be up there, um, I'm going to just be reading here, 2 Corinthians 11, 24 through 31. Remember, real human, real person, real planet, this is what he says. Five times I received at the hands of the Jews 40 lashes less one. Now, just real quick here, if you don't know, the 40 lashes minus one was because they believed if you got 40 lashes, you died. So they took one away. So they beat him within an inch of, of his life, almost to the point of death, five times. Think about that. Not one time, not two times, not three times, not four times, five times he got this 39 lashes minus one. And that's not even all of the stuff in this here. That's just that one example. How many, how many of us, and myself included, would have this happen one time, right? And I'd be like, I'm good. I'll be a Christian, but I will shut up, right? Paul doesn't do that. He goes on. He says, three times I was beaten with rocks. Once I was stoned. Again, they, they stoned you because they were trying to kill you, okay? Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. A night and a day I was adrift at sea. Now again, a night and a day. That's a long time to just be bobbing up and down the waves, thinking about your life choices. Right? And thinking, God, this isn't what I'm supposed to be doing. I'm supposed to be, right? And he's just there, a night and a day. Um, he says, I was adrift at sea. On frequent journeys, in danger from rivers, danger from robbers, danger from my own people, danger from Gentiles, danger in the city, danger in the wilderness, danger at sea, danger from false brothers, in toil and hardship through many a sleepless night, in hunger and thirst, often without food, in cold and exposure. And apart from all these other things, there is the daily pressure on me of my anxiety for all of the church. Who is weak and I am not weak? Who is made to fall and I am not indignant? Yeah, that just kind of means um, like burning with anger because of somebody's sin. Okay? Then he finishes with this, he says, if I must boast, I will boast of the things that show my weakness. The God and Father of the Lord Jesus, who is blessed forever, knows that I am not mine. Okay, Paul says, look, I know how to be brought low. And then he says, I have learned the secret. Okay, this word this word is mueo, okay, mueo. And it means to be initiated into the mystery. How do you think Paul was initiated into the mystery? Through those trials. Now, look, we're all struggling with something, right? We're probably all struggling with a lot of things, right? But what if God is just trying to teach you through those struggles that you can't control those events? But you can focus on Him and learn to be content. What if that's how you learn to be content? Is through the trials. Does that bring just a little bit of value to the trials that you're going through? Does that bring maybe just a little bit of value to the, or maybe a little bit of redemption to the craziness of this world that's going on around us? We're going to retouch on that here in a little bit, but how, right? How do we do this impossible task of being content in this crazy world that seems just keeps getting crazier? How is this 
possible? Well, it goes right to the last verse that we're going to be examining today, which is one of the most abused verses in the Bible, but we're going to go to verse 13, and he just says simply, I can do all things through him. Right off the bat, given everything we just kind of talked about and laid out here this morning, doesn't that verse just mean something a little bit different uh, than how most tend to use it? In the context, Paul is saying, I can be content despite all of this because God strengthens you to do so. That's how it happens. Okay, now that's one thing to say, but how does that happen? Right? These are all nice platitudes, but how does this happen? How does he strengthen me? What do I have to do, Kevin? What do I have to think about? What do I have to uh, concentrate on? Well, let me give you what I'm affectionately calling the three legs to the tripod of contentment, if you will. Three legs to the tripod of contentment. The first leg is God's providence. God's providence. Again, we talked about this a little bit earlier, but what does providence mean? Well, simply put, it just means God provides. But it actually goes a little bit deeper than that, um, and it actually means that God orchestrates everything to accomplish His purpose. Okay, he's like a he's like a, like a conductor to this massive uh, cosmic-wide uh, orchestra. He's orchestrating and guiding all the events to accomplish His purpose. That's how God provides. I'm going to borrow from John MacArthur here real quick because I think this is a fascinating point he made in uh, his sermon and um, it just really helps us understand God's providence. I mean, how can you guys reference God's providence if you don't know what it is? So uh, there are two ways in which God can manifest his providence. One is by a miracle, right? what we would call a miracle. A miracle is when God disrupts a natural flow of events in a dramatic an unexplained fashion and immediately manifests his providence. Right? So we call it a miracle, but God wants to do something. He wants to do, uh, you know, he wants to cure sickness that maybe the doctor can't explain. He wants to bring somebody back from the dead. Uh, creation itself, right? So these are all, time is going and there's this abrupt, you know, God's providence interrupts that time. We call it a miracle. All right, now the second way that God's providence is manifested is also the second leg to the tripod of contentment, and that is God's sovereignty. Okay, God's sovereignty. Now you'll say, you know, wait, I thought God's sovereignty was God's providence. I thought his providence was his sovereignty. And it's not quite. You could say that God has sovereignty to use his providence. Okay? But I'll make it even a little bit more simpler than that. Sovereignty is his right and power to do. All that he has decided to do, providence is the ability to orchestrate the event to carry out what he has decided to do. Okay? Okay. All right, so leg one, understanding and believing God's providence. Leg two, understanding and believing God's sovereignty. Now what's leg three? Well, leg three, um, as you grow in your knowledge of those first two legs, leg three just kind of happens by itself. But leg three is separating yourself from the circumstances going on around you. Right? Look at verse 11 again. He says, I have learned in whatever situation I am to be content. This is him separating himself from the circumstances going on around him. He goes on in verse 12 to expound upon that. He says, in any in every circumstance, I have learned the secret of facing plenty and hunger, abundance and need. All right, so here it is. Here's the secret. This is just the, this is my, 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 my tripod secret in a single sentence. You can find contentment when you separate yourself from the circumstances around you through an understanding of God's sovereignty. Say that again. You can find contentment when you separate yourself from the circumstances around you through an understanding 
of God's sovereign providence. Or, put it in the negative, just for contrast, and to really drive the point home, you can't find content. It is impossible to be content when you are continually bogged down in the circumstances around you that you don't honestly believe that God is sovereign and in control. Here's the point to all of this. Listen carefully. Paul was content because having caught a glimpse of God, he knew that everything in this world is temporary. Everything in this world is temporary. And why would you sweat something that is temporary? All this stuff, all this, this entire planet, everything, it is all nothing. That's why he says, look, I could have a lot, I could have a little, and I could wildly fluctuate in between. Right? And that just kind of makes both work. Right? If you constantly were living in abundance, I know that sounds great, especially your pitfall tale. But if you were constantly living in abundance, you could get used to that. If you were constantly living in want, I know that's, you know, but you could get used to that. When you're swinging back and forth between them, it just makes both worse. Right? And Paul has done that. Um, one moment he says, I'm in jail with nothing, and the next moment, I have everything. Because you guys just sent me a bunch of stuff. But none of that matters. Except as a credit to your account. But none of the physical stuff matters, is what I'm saying. None of the physical stuff matters because I have the only thing that does matter. And that's Jesus Christ. The secret to being content is to understand that everything around us is just an ash. And the only way to understand that to constantly cultivate in your mind to get some understanding who Christ is and what he has done. John Flavel, um, he's a Puritan, uh, I won't get into all that, but he wrote a book, um, he wrote a lot of books, but in his book, The Fountain of Life Opened Up, he wrote the following. Listen to this, this is absolutely beautiful. He says, O oh, fair sun and fair moon, and fair stars, and fair flowers, and fair roses, and fair lilies, and fair creatures. But oh, ten thousand, thousand times fairer, Lord Jesus. Alas, I wronged him in making the comparison this way. Oh, dark sun and moon, but oh, fair Lord Jesus. Oh, dark flowers and dark lilies and roses, but oh, fair, fair, ever fair, Lord Jesus. O oh, all fair things, dark and deformed and without beauty, when ye are compared, or when ye are set beside the fairest Lord Jesus. O oh, dark heaven, but O oh, fair Christ. O oh, dark angel, but O oh, surpassingly fair Lord Jesus. And John Flavel knew something of the beauty of Christ. The same way the Apostle Paul knew something of the beauty of Christ. I wish at this point in the sermon I could share something with you to give you like the tiniest glimpse of the beauty of God. I, I, I wish I could form the words um, that would just give you a glimpse of who the Savior is or, or what He's done, such that, as, as he put here, that you would be, that the fairest thing on the planet is nothing but darkness and the form and perish. What words can I say to relay that to you? What adjective could I use? What syntax could I compose? What comparison or analogy could I possibly give that could share the tiniest glimpse of the beauty of who Christ is? This is the theme of preaching. Our subject matter is so beautiful and so far beyond our comprehension, let alone description, that there just are no words to exalt him to the level that he should be exalted to. 
That's what Playboy is saying here. If I was to gather every beautiful thing on this planet, if I was to gather every perfect flower and every colorful fish, if I was to gather every filled forest and every crystal clear sea, if I was to go gather up every snow-capped mountain and every white sandy beach and every fiery sunrise and every cotton candy sunset, and if I was to gather all that up and lay it here before you and I say, behold, all this beauty should remind you of Christ. That moment, the only thing I would have done was in the cross. I would have done no more than wrong. It's like Edward Payson once said, to capture the beauty of Christ, it would be less difficult to enclose the sun into a lamp. You would have less difficulty going to the sun and chunk by chunk trying to fit that sun into a lamp. You would have an easier time doing that than understanding the beauty of Christ. However, these are the truths that the Christian is called to set their mind to. The task is impossible. But that's glorious. Right? How glorious is it that it is impossible to understand the infinite beauty of the God we serve? How tragic is it that we end up doing the exact opposite? What a waste. Everything is so backwards to the way God wants things to be. We are not content with these finite things all around us until we chase after them. But we are perfectly content with our relationship with the infinite, the infinite God. And so we are perfectly content with that relationship so we can see that alone. Perhaps to prove it to maybe at least some of you, I'd like to conduct a quick experiment. Now, please don't answer out loud. Okay, I'm going to ask you a question. I just want you to remember the first thing that pops into your brain. The first thing that comes to your mind when I ask the question. You may, you may think of you know, a couple things, but I want you to remember the first thing that comes to your mind. Okay? Ready? Here's the question. What do you think of when you think of that? Okay? Got it? Remember, perhaps some of you thought about when you see a loved one. Perhaps some of you thought about gold or maybe the celestial city itself. Perhaps the pearly gate. Maybe if you know Revelation, you thought about the walls being made of these big, beautiful gemstones, rubies, diamonds, emeralds. Now, I've shared this in my Sunday school before, but if you thought about the golden roads or the pearly gate, you know, people they tend to think that the streets are paved with gold because of how valuable gold is. And it somehow increases the value of heaven. They tend to think it's the exact opposite. What if God paved the gold, his gold or paved his streets with gold because it's so worth it? Right? I mean, you're not out there gawking at the, at the asphalt on the road, are you? Right? And why? Because you've seen it for a couple of years? What if you were here for 10,000 years? Would you be out there gawking at the road? Right? You're just seeing it every day, it gets old. Right? You think about it. What if God uses our most precious metal as asphalt? And uses diamonds as mortar because compared to Christ, gold, diamonds, emeralds, pearls are worth no more than tar covered rocks and clay pressed bricks. I mean, just think it out logically for a second. But you get to heaven, you walk in, you're like, oh yeah, they really are made of gold. How long did that take? Like five seconds, right? You have all of eternity before you, and you just spent a whole five seconds 
discovering what most people think about when you think about that. But let me give you an exorbitant amount. We're still in our experiment. Let me give you an exorbitant amount of time here. Just look at these words. I'm going to give you five whole minutes. Think about how long five minutes is. Five minutes of just walking at the street with gold. Lay on them, press them. And you'll probably be looking at you a little weird. Not the way you even trying to walk, but you got five minutes. You can just sit and, and do whatever you want to do with your gold. Now, let's run this out. Let's say you stand up and you walk over to the wall. You say, hey, Ken, it says about the wall being made of gemstones and you go to the wall. And there they are. It's beautiful. And you have five minutes now to sit and stare at this wall. There, it's the gemstone. When you walk down the wall, you go to the pearly gate. Right? And then it's there. It's a huge gate made from a single pearl, and it's beautiful. And it's beautiful. So you have five minutes of sitting, staring at a gate. Okay, now what? Then in 15 minutes in heaven, you've exhausted the sights. Right? You have all of eternity. Think of how long you've been alive. You have, now picture how long 10,000 years is. Now think about 10,000 years is nothing but one millionth of a millisecond for all of eternity. You see that there has to be something more to heaven than streets of gold and pearly gates. Or eternity is going to be incredibly boring pretty darn quick. So what's left? What else is there? Obviously, by now, the answer is obvious. I want you to remember your first response when I asked that question. And so if it's not streets of gold and it's not pearly gates, well then what will rapture your attention forever? Well, how about an infinitely loving, infinitely good, infinitely righteous, infinitely just, infinitely holy, infinitely true, infinitely faithful, infinitely merciful, infinitely patient, infinitely great, and infinitely relational, perfect, eternal, immutable, omnipotent, omnipresent, omniscient, and infinitely sufficient God. How about that? Do you think that will keep your attention for eternity? That's a God that I can worship. That's a God that I can track down for all of eternity and learn from and love and be loved from for an eternity. Seeking after that same thought pattern here and now, that's how you get repentance here. That's the truth. All of that, all of that stuff we just talked about, it all starts here, in this life. You're in your eternal life right now. You know that? Some people think like there's like a, like, a, like, a, like a switch that flips when you die, and now you're in your eternal life. You're in your eternal life right now. Now here's the application of this, but it's a hard truth, so listen to me. With all the love I have in my heart, I say this. If you don't want Christ here, you are not going to want Christ there. If you don't want greater and greater revelation of who Christ is here, you are not going to want greater and greater revelation of who Christ is there. If you don't want more and more of Christ Jesus here, you are not going to want more and more of Christ there. In the negative, again, we do the negative for the contrast, if you find Christ boring here, you will find Christ boring there. It's the same Christ. And you're the same person. What's going to be different? God, Christ is heaven. God is heaven. There is no heaven without God, and there's nothing more than God in heaven. Now, I, I know our sin nature is going to be removed. And I know we're not going to be able to sin there. And I know we will know more 
there. As 1 Corinthians 13 says, Now I know in part, then I shall know fully. So you're going to know more there, but I'm talking about your desire, not your understanding. What's your desire? What's the longing of your heart? That's what's not going to change. The longing of your heart. What it longs after here and now is going to be what it longs after there. But if you let that mind shift happen here and now, then this contentment through separating ourselves from the circumstances by understanding the sovereignty of God's providence, if that starts to happen here, like it did for Paul and Flavel and so many others, suddenly you want to study. Right? You want to pray and not get distracted by the cares of this world. There's no secret sauce here. It's hard for you. I understand that because it's hard for me. It's hard for everybody. It's just hard. But you have to turn from this world. You have to put the hard work into, as Second Corinthians says, take thought every captive to obey Christ. Take, cap sorry, take captive every thought to obey Christ. That takes work. Right? It take, taking your thoughts captive that's hard work. Listen, guys, I can sit up here and in this environment, I can say a lot of nice things and we can all agree, but listen, Tuesday's coming. Thursday is coming. And you're not going to be thinking about this sermon at that time. That's when the work happens. You have to sacrifice your fleshly desires and you have to tell them no. I don't need that. I don't need to watch that. I need to read scripture. I don't need to stare at my phone for six hours a night. I need to pray. I need to talk to the God who loves me. To the God who surpasses every beautiful thing on this planet and still came down to die for my sins because he loves me. That's all I've done. I need to talk to that God far more than I need to watch another cat fall off a shelf. Right? And when you desire Christ like that here on earth, that's when you learn the kind of contentment that Paul is talking about. Here. That's when you're the heir. That's when you are initiated into the secret. And I'll say this. If you're here chasing cars and houses and streets of gold because you think it's going to bring you contentment or it's going to bring you happiness, you will never get it. Never. Because, listen to me, you will never get it because God loves you too much to let you be content by something that is less than he is. I'm going to repeat that. God loves you too much to let you be content by something that is less than He is. I'm ending on this. The last time I was up here, I challenged you guys with a little QA that I often challenge myself. I don't know if you'll remember it, but it goes something like this Do you believe God is real? And if you're a Christian and you answer yes, like I do, then the challenge becomes and live like believe that God is real, then live like it. And what you'll find is, is as you live like that, you are okay with whatever happens, because you know that God is orchestrating the event. He has to be, or else, you, or else you're saying that he's not sovereign, and that the events are happening out of his control. If you say that, then you're saying that God isn't God. You're saying that there's something else above him. You see? There's just no way to have Contentment like that. And don't think for a second that Satan isn't using whoever gets into the White House every four years to keep you distracted from the real fight that's going on out there. Or any of the other myriad of dangling things that he uses in this modest world to keep you distracted. And discontentment is one of the main distractions for the Christian. Because none of it 
has any bearing on your calling given to you by Jesus, which is to go into all the world and make disciples. To love the Lord your God with all your heart, your mind, your soul, and your strength. And to love your neighbor as yourself. All these theaters, all these world events, all this stuff, they're nothing but distractions to get you out of the fight and keep you out of the fight. The real fight. If the absolute worst happens, and we lose all this, we lose all these privileges, and we can no longer worship God in this way, in the threat of persecution, good. Good. And the bride gets purified. Right? The riffraff, false converts, the wolves, they all flee. And then we, the pure church, we just go underground. And we keep doing our job. And if we're discovered there, and they throw us into jail, well, brother, well, sister, let's need to start a prison ministry. You with me? And if the worst of the worst happens and we're killed, and murder us. Hey, we need to live as Christ and to die as gain. Let him kill us. It only gets better. Amen? Amen. It sounds like contentment to me. Heavenly Father, um, what can we say? Uh, you are great. You are mighty. You are worshipful. You are worthy. You are worthy of everything, God. I just pray for the Holy Spirit uh, to help me, to help Andrew here, to help all of us remember your beauty and remember who you are and who we serve. 